Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, user-based security, the, the term is borrowed from the micro curves who mm -hmm. uses this term to stress that you not only have to build security in your systems for creating the Internet of Things, but you also have to make it usable in the sense that application developers and users of those applications are able to correctly configure the system to use that those security functions that you have. This morning we already have heard about the communication in constraint environments and I'm focusing currently on the communication that uses co-app but um, the functions that I show you could be used for other communication as well. If you uh, want to do that but yeah the application uh, proof of concept implementations are currently using co-app. Um, what I currently focus on is using thing that are the uh, security mechanisms that are well known from the HTTP based web, which is TLS over TCP on the, um, on the web. Um, and when using CoAP, you currently focus on DTLS, the UDP version of TLS. And the big problem now is how to use that correctly in the sense that you get usable security or uh, how are users um, empowered to keep the control over their data and their devices that handle this data. And the answer, answer to that is authorization. You uh, express your own will what has to happen with your data. Riot already brings a lot of building blocks and tools that you need to have to do that. So we have several coin implementations, including GCOAP and NanoCoAP, MicroCoAP, and there's a, a libcoAP version that, that has an old libcoAP uh, port. Um, we have libraries for representing the data, such as the uh, CNC bar and tiny C bar implementations, but you could also use ASM1. Just lift it up and, and there's an ASM1 library in the right as well. Uh, and of course, you could, could use JSON. Then there's a bunch of crypto tools, including parts of major crypto libraries that are supposed to uh, support embedded devices such as Tweet Necro, Micro ECC, and so on. And there are at least two DJS implementations I know of. One is Tiny DJS, which uh, is now in, in its current version um, in, in uh, Riot. And the Wolf SSL people are working on their port for Riot as far as I know. Um, the question now is how to use these. So you have each tool and the API for that tool, but the question is, uh, what do I have to do as an application developer to send data securely over, for example, query? Two options are available right now. None of them has been merged into the right master by now. Uh, one has been developed uh, primarily by Raul uh, Fuentes. Which is based on two modules, the SOC Secure module and the TLS manager. There are two pull requests open that discuss, that discuss the API and the changes that you need. And the basic idea of the role was that he um, provides an API that um, reflects the existing socket primitives. So you have the connect and send and read um, primitives now for secure sockets and the objects that are parsed, passed to these primitives are pretty much the same as the uh, SOC UDP data structures. Um, to make this agnostic of the TLS implementation that's being used underneath, um, he developed another module that abstracts from the primitives of the underlying DTLS implementation. And this is called TLS main. And there you have some primitives, set of primitives that pretty much 
or a generic way of describing what the DTLS or TLS implementation has to do, such as create a secure association and send data over the channel that, that you have opened and at some time shut down the connection and so on. And the proof of concept that Raul developed currently uses the manual co op server to show how, how you can send the request over DTLS to the manual co op server and get the response on your channel, and then the channel is shut down. And there's work going on for GCOAP as well, um, where pretty much the same uh, will happen. Uh, because GCOAP has another event loop, the integration is a bit more difficult for this TLS main approach. The um, SOC, SOC secure server would be used like this, which is a lot of code, but it's not that difficult to read once you let it set a bit. So it says pretty much that you create this secure session object and uh, initialize the entire detail is stack with the cipher seed and uh, you have to pre-configure some, some keys uh, under the hood and then you just create a socket object and uh, initialize that with the local and the remote mode address so you have a secure association between two entities. <coughs> and then you just have your while loop that says uh, some secure read where the nano core server and the white address are called sub PDP receiver. The other option is developed by Ken um, called SOC PDSEC, um, which currently lives in, in Ken's uh, Riot fork, which does a similar thing but without the abstraction from the TLS library. So currently, the primitives proposed here are. Um, Socket related primitives like create, connect, read, send, but um, use tiny details under the hood. And everything except for the initialization and, and the configuration of the keys is hidden from the application developer. So, for example, the GCOAP implementation um, does a send by just replacing the UDP socket send by the TDSEC connect and TDSEC send that are shown here on, on, on the bottom of this graph. I think this option is very clean and a good way forward um, because you really have to do very limited changes to the existing software. The TLS manager um, does a good job of hiding the complexity from the underlying TLS implementation. But you have another abstraction layer in between that you have to understand before you can create applications based on that. So here, there's uh, everything hidden from the application developer. Um, but we have in both options some both options some limitations to consider. One thing is more or less cosmetic. Um, the credentials currently are defined at this time in both approaches. So. For the TDSEC option, you have to create this array with the credentials that you know. The first is the um, PSK identity that is used for pre-shared credentials. Uh, the other one is the, um, the secret key the PSK that you are using. Um, the option number one, the TLS main SOC secure option from now, it does a similar thing, but uh, there are um, Tiny detail specific names being used, and the um, build time configuration is um, dependent on the DLS library as well. So both SSL would probably have another um, configuration uh, file to be used. Um, the problem with this is that you have to know every potential communication peer and the credentials that you. Um, used to authenticate that peer in advance. In this case, at the build time, so it's not difficult to make it um, different that, that you um, provide the credentials by starting the application or have a runtime configuration mechanism to change those. But 
in every case, you have to know those credentials before you can communicate with your peer. The next problem is just complexity. Currently, there's only one security association in both options. So you have a single UDP port um, where only DTNS handshakes and DTLS protected data is, is, is expected. So you have no multiplexing with, for example, unprotected traffic. Um, the problem with this is that applications that might keep session state over multiple uh, requests, response transactions, cannot do that because they don't know which requests come over which session. This is, everything here is under the hood, and currently none of the existing CoAP implementations are right except for the current version of the CoAP, which hasn't been ported to Riot currently provides this information to the user or to the application that uses this CLIP stack. So this is one thing that might need to be reconsidered when trying to implement usable security. That you need some sort of handle that shows you in which session co-app messages are being transported, especially on the client side. So you have to decide when, when, when you carry around multiple DTL sessions that you say, this code message should go over that security association. And finally, in the current version or the current way you can deal with this information, you have no authorization at all. There's either um, the choice to say, I send this data when I have a, a, a DTLS channel between two entities. So it's, it's like an all or nothing. Either data is exchanged or not. Um, you cannot decide whether this endpoint gets this sort of data and that point gets another sort of data because this, this information is missing. So what we did is we took a step back and we considered our goals. So um, what we want to have is that we have a server, S and client, and the server just waits for code requests and then um, responds either with a 401 um, unauthorized that tells the, um, the client to go away and, and get some authorization for the request or send the data that it's supposed to get. So the problem in the Internet of Things is that we don't necessarily know who the client is in advance. This makes, this makes it difficult because then we cannot pre-configure its credentials. So what we did is that we designed a new authorization protocol that allows for a secure exchange of authorization information and does or ties that um, authorization information to a secure channel. In this case, this would be a DTLS channel, but it could also be on the application layer, which uh, sometimes is called object security, where you re-implement the security <coughs> primitives not on the transport layer, but on the server. Um, the most simple thing to do in this case is to use uh, symmetric key cryptography with pre-shared keys, which is a good thing, because it's easy to implement, it's well understood, and to some degree, cost quantum safe. We will hear about that in a couple of hours. Um, and another design, design decision was to make this uh, in a way that it uh, resembles the RESTful web architecture style and tries to get to, to offload the most complex tasks from the constraint devices uh, to devices that are more powerful and that help in managing the authentication and the authorization decisions. You might know this from the web where you have OAuth, where some authorization server says what is allowed, what, what, what a requesting client is allowed to do and what not. And, and this uh, authorization rules are cramped into an access token that is passed around the web. And we could do in principle the same thing here. One important issue 
for this organization to work is that you need to be able to authenticate the entity that you're talking to. Because only then you know which authorization rules apply to that entity. And this is why we introduced the term authenticated authorization to really stress that point that um, we want to verify that the entity that we're talking to has the attributes we think it has, and the authorization is based on those attributes. This is what happens um, with certificates on the web. When you have a set of attributes, NSCA signs that someone who has a specific public key um, or is known to have these attributes, which usually are specifically the domain name that you just have connected. And the authenticated authorization uh, just says we have the set of attributes and somebody endorses this that, that um, these attributes apply to a specific entity and certain authorization rules or permissions are set by the owner of the data that we are talking about for this entity with these attributes. To do that, a set of tasks has to be fulfilled. I'm not going on uh, each of this, these tasks. The important is that you have two steps. One thing is before communication can take place at all. This is that uh, we have some sort of attribute verifier binding, which is exactly what the CAs on the web do. They check attributes and then endorse the validity of these attributes by signing them, that is creating a cryptographic Ver verifier um, that says I have checked these attributes. And then you can define access policies. That is the authorization rules where you say this entity with these attributes is supposed to send a GET request or a code, post but not a delete to following resources on my server. And at the time of the request, that is when the DTLS channel is set up, um, you have to check against these authorization rules. That is, first of all, you have to retrieve the rules and then check the verifier that is bound to these rules against the attributes of the entity that is currently that, that you're currently talking to, to ensure that this is the entity that the access rules um, that have been defined apply to. As said before, not all of these tasks are suited for the constraint level devices. This is in our terminology, um, such as class one, class one devices defined in RC 72 and A, um, which is sort of embedded devices that run right. Um, the idea is that the server on this side and the client um, utilize some in-between devices, such as an authorization server, to help with the authentication of the authorization process. The important thing is that on the principal level, we have some entities in the physical world, humans that own the devices, or companies that own the devices, or that somehow are given the privilege to define authorization rules, that are in charge of the client and the server. And this is usually or these are usually different persons. So we have uh, an overseeing principal, a cop on the client side, and an overseeing principal on the server side. And they not usually know each other in advance, but they get to know each other when they enter a business relationship where the cop and the sub um, define that they want to authorize themselves and their devices to do the certain things. And this authorization can be um, supported by devices on a less constrained level, which are servers in the internet or in the cloud or somewhere uh, that do the authentication between the security domain of the client side and the server side. And here we can use web certificates without any problems. We have the processing power to 
um, check the 150 trust anchors in, in on our operating system, uh, do the entire ver certificate verification chain, ASM1 parsing, etc. Et so this is an easy task that can be done in the web without any problem. And then we can formulate abbreviated versions of these authorization decisions and pass them to the client and the server that need to enforce these abbreviated authorization decisions. So a priori, both C and C, uh, C and S do not know each other and don't have their mutual authentication because they don't have the credentials that they would use to have to use to uh, authenticate each other. But we can create these credentials on the middle layer, the, the less constrained unit, because we have the capacity for processing and communication to generate cryptographic verifiers that um, formulate the authorization uh, to enforce. So the initial trust relationships before C and S start to communicate are these. So we have some relationship between C and its client authorization manager, so an authorization manager that helps the client on the, right, on the left side, and the same on the, on the right side. In the web, you usually have the OAuth authorization server, which is some type of, some, some sort of, of uh, strip down SAM, and the usual resource server on the web, and the, the same is here. And then, when the, the client authorization manager, the CAM, and the server authorization manager, the SAM, start talking to each other, they build another security association based on the trust relationship that has been formed on some sort of business logic level. The protocol, I don't want to go into the details, will look like this. So we have predefined security associations um, between C and its CAM and S and its SAM, which just means that we have to pre-configure credentials on both sides. And then whenever we try to start to, to bootstrap our application, we have to contact the CAM from C and the SAM from S to get information or at least build up some sort of uh, relationship. And then whenever C tries to, to start communicating with S, it needs to get the authorization ticket um, to do that. And it just that doesn't have to talk directly to the uh, SAM firm from S, which it doesn't know anyway, and it doesn't have the the means to authenticate that entity, but it knows how to talk and authenticate its own client authorization manager. It just delegates the task of talking to SAM um, to the CAN. And then the second, or this, this um, <coughs> overlying security association between CAN and SAM is found, and the ticket request is posted and hopefully responded to in a successful way. And the ticket that, that passes from SAM to CAM then is passed on to C, which can use the information from that access ticket to create a secure channel with S. This is um, done like this, where SAM creates a ticket that has two parts. One is the ticket phase that contains the authorization information that S needs to decide um, whether C is allowed to do certain things or S, and some server information that C uses to communicate with S. So, um, in detail, these consist of um, cryptographic utilities such as the nonce and a verifier, which is just a newly generated session key, which we have to add to our key store in the client and in the server um, to be able to set up a DTLS security association or some application layer security association. So in summary, um, we use less constraint nodes to do the hard work. Usually this could include public key cryptography. There's no reason not to do that on that level. 
Um, then we can utilize uh, DTLS or object security to transmit that authorization information through C to the server S. And once we have done that, based on this access ticket generated in a cryptographically secure way by Sam and possibly a little modified by Cam, um, both entities get to know the session key that is to, supposed to be used between C and S, and S gets the authorization information. And the knowledge of this newly generated or even derived session key by C and S um, can, you, can be used to cryptographically authenticate both entities against each other. That's the trick here. If both know the session key, and both have retrieved the session key in a cryptographically secure way, we can be sure that these are the authenticated entities. And that's the trick here. Um, since we initially have supposed that um, this session would take a little longer and there will really be more than one coed request response going on and forth, for example, when doing a blockwise transfer, doing observed relationships, or just subscribing an entity and, and get some information back later, um, this session can be held as long as the ticket allows to test a lifetime of like a day or two days, a week, and we can keep up open, keep open this uh, session as long as we want. There is an example implementation, and due to the limitations of NanoCoil and GCoil, where you don't get the session information, I did that in LibCoil, or using LibCoil version uh, 4.2.0, which is to be released, released soon, um, where you just have to create this sort of DCAF context. DCAF is the name that we dub this protocol, uh, where you define the URI of your own authorization manager. For example, here, this am.dkf.science is the authorization manager that is used by this particular server that this code runs on. And then we set the, um, the uh, pre-shared credentials for talking to that authorization manager. The identity identification is our host name. It's um, from here somewhere s out constraint of space. This is the server that uses um, this credentials for talking to the AM. Um, and then we run our call. So that's the initialization. And in the request handler, we have to uh, register with the uh, core server. Um, whenever a request comes in, we can ask if the request is authorized within this session. The session information here is passed as parameter to the handle request function. And if not, we just terminate the session, uh, probably by sending some information that tells the client who sent the request there to find our authorization manager so it can get an access ticket from that authorization manager. And if everything is okay, then we handle the authorized request. So this pretty much resembles what is done in, in uh, typical web servers as well. And ideally, this would be done right in the core app implementation. So when the request handler is uh, called, the authorization is already done. So the user won't have to do this. Uh, you could by, for example, uh, accidentally missing this uh, Negation here um, introduce a big security hole. So, in conclusion, um, when you want to do usable security, you require effective and simple APIs that you can, can do as um, where you have as low possibility for making errors as possible. Um, and usually, we cannot assume that the client that wants to talk to some server already knows the authorization server that is in charge of the server. Usually this is not the case because uh, in the internet two different security domains where they are located. Right? So we need multi-domain authorization across different security um, boundaries. 
The complexity of authentication of authorization can be delegated to devices on a less constrained level. We can do public key cryptography and so on and so on. Um, and we usually need to have a long lasting security association where we can have more than one request response. For Riot, this means that we should finish the DTLS sockets co op integration that I have sketched before. Currently, we have two options the uh, SOC secure TLS man option or the TDSEC option. Um, and we should decide which way to go and how the API should look like from the using application uh, perspective. So that's a very important part. And somehow the application needs to get the information on which session certain messages have arrived um, to be able to continue <laughs> sending all that session. So that's an important observation here. And then um, at this PCAP protocol to distribute keys, so we don't have to configure pre-shared keys except for the one security association with our less constrained authorization manager. And the other keys would be distributed using that dynamic authorization protocol. So thank you very much for listening. Questions? Thank you very much. I'm sorry, my bad is just part. Why CMS have to communicate their handle? Why can't they do all the communication via CF, CM, and SAM? Okay, so you mean um, why doesn't S talk to its SAM to get the authorization information? No, no, uh, I mean C, uh, C and C, CM are connected and CM and SAM are connected, and S and SAM are connected. Why can't they just talk via this channel? Why uh, can't they talk securely over that channel? Or why do they need to talk directly? So you might why using this communication channel instead of yeah. this? Yeah, exactly. Okay, you uh, missed that because I didn't mention that. <laughs> um, the reason is that um, especially the servers that we have are pretty like. Mm, a temperature sensor or something like that are pretty low on energy and try to minimize their outward communication relationships. Um, and so um, instead of keeping up this <coughs> communication the entire time, we shut it down when we can and um, take the burden of communicating with Sam to the client C because the client is the one that wants something from us. So he should take the burden of communicating with Sam and we just have to pass the access ticket from here and from C to S directly whenever C thinks that it is authorized to really do the communication. So that's the same communication is more expensive than C. Um, at least if we do it frequently. So usually it isn't, but we don't, at, at most, most of the time we don't have to, to do that because there's nothing except for getting the information that somebody wants to communicate with us um, from Sam. So this one doesn't even need to be co-located somewhere with S. We could put this somewhere in the internet, whereas S might be in some environment where it doesn't have direct internet connection, but just some low bitrate connection that, that C can use to talk to us. So this channel may not be right? Right. In this, in this picture, it's just the, the security domain. It's, it doesn't necessarily have to, to have a direct channel. One uh, thanks for your talk. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, if there are millions of devices associated with your authorization manager, how do you solve the scalability issue? 
So the authorization manager has no capability issue as long as it solves the 10 or 100k problem. Uh -huh. So like you can distribute it somewhere in the cloud. Okay, so uh, the other question is uh, if there is a malicious authorization server join your system, how can you uh, yeah, address this situation? So, so the, the, the main issue here is that you have to trust your own authorization manager. So Scass has to trust Sam. This is the same as in the web as it is today. If you don't trust your the entity that gives you the authorization information, then you're lost. So there's no, no harm done here in, in um, making this, designing this the same way. The problem is to tell if the other side, the CAM, is malicious or not. And this is solved on the business relationship. Where you authentic from, from the CAM side, uh, from the same side, you authenticate the CAM and vice versa. Like in the web today, the, the CAM now is a web browser. Where you just have the user that decides is the other end trusted or not. And the other end, the web server does the same. It somehow decides whether the requesting user is trusted or not. Final quick question and final quick answer. Yeah. Um, okay. so yeah, yeah. I have a question from the internet. Uh, the question is uh, the DCAP, uh, as you described it, is uh, an internet graph that is expired. So there was a question if that is getting picked up again. So yeah, it made this talk wrong. There's no short answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is yes, in some way. So there's standardization work that is based on this expired internet draft. But the current status misses this part. Okay. Um, the problem is now you have really have to have CMS in the same security domain. And the Second part of that answer is that there's research work um, to be published soon that describes this in more detail. Okay, thanks, Olaf. We can continue the discussions away. Thanks again.